I'm Dr. Marion Kirtley, and I'm going to interview uh, Major General Robert D. Wolver, who is uh, here this morning to be one of uh, the subject of our oral uh, history. Bob, welcome. Thank you, Doc. Good to be here. And uh, we're very happy to have you here. This is the first time we've had a Major General here, I think. Even though you are retired, of course, you win some and lose some. <laughs> uh, you, uh, you recently commanded the 38th Infantry Division of the Indiana National Guard, is that right? Yes, that's true. When did you retire, Bob? I retired in 1982, in August of 82. Well, it must be a good while. I'm going to tell you. Well, you know, eight years. Right. <laughs> Well, you've had a wonderful military experience, and we do want to go through uh, a bit of your background and bring up some of the wartime experience of World War II. I might say that this is uh, Friday, August the 28th, 1993, and uh, we're continuing these oral interviews, and we think that this will, these things will be very important in the future to the, our historical society. Okay, Bob. Uh, Let's uh, have some information about your early life, where, where you were born, what time, and so on. Well, I was born right here in Crawfordsville, over in Fishville, actually, in the house. My father owned the grocery store, and uh, we lived right next door to it. And then maybe you remember Dr. Cooksey? Yes, indeed. He was judging uh, home toward the fair. I was born August <laughs> the 30th. He was judging hogs toward the fair, and he quit judging hogs and come over and delivered me. I don't know what that means, but that, <laughs> and then uh, my dad took me over to the store and weighed me on some new scales. He just got uh, at the store. What what day was that? What? Well, that's uh, the 30th of August, and then uh, of an evening. Uh, 30th. Hey, you know, that's two days from now. That's well, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> that's great. Well, you 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 grew, you grew a little. How much did you weigh? Did anybody tell you how much you weighed? No, but I, they did, and it's <laughs> on the birth certificate. I don't remember. Okay. I wasn't that big. I never was that big <laughs> right. until I got older. Okay, where, where did you go to school? And, uh, well, I went to the uh, just about all the grade schools in Crawford. I started out the first first year of school in Whitesville. Oh, in Whitesville, so. Indiana, and we lived in Whitesville. And only time we lived outside the city, and I started school there. And then uh, we moved into town and, uh, of course, back to the Depression, back during the Depression. And I went to, I think, just about every grade school, uh, elementary school in Crawfordville. And Crawfordville High School? Crawfordville High School. Mm -hmm. When did you graduate? I did not graduate from Crawfordville High School. I was, I had a choice of either going when the National Guard was mobilized or fin finish my, my, uh, senior year of high school and since then uh, in the military schools and the other schools I've got equivalent to my PhD. I mean of course you have to get that for us uh, for us get a people of the general. All right well now what uh, uh, when, when did you actually sign up then as in the National Guard? I signed up about uh, uh, well this time of year uh, the regulations was well, back in 1939 that you had to be 18 years old to serve in the military right. service. Uh, the National Guard was pretty lenient on that because they needed the, the manpower yeah, actually. And uh, Owen Grisigas commanded the Crowardsville Battery, Battery B, 139th Field Artillery at the time. And I guess he had a policy, uh, if they big enough, why well, they'd sign them up no matter what age they were. And if they weren't large enough, why well, he would normally wait till they were 17 years old. That was an unwritten policy I'm sure he had. And so just as soon as I turned 17, I had a, an older brother that served with me during World War II, two years older than I was in B Battery. And uh, so we, just as soon as I turned uh, 17, in 1939, I went down and signed up and, and be back. Where, where did you have your original training? Here? In, well, you know, back in those days, we gave our own basic training. The military units gave their own basic training. And what I got in the local battery is, of course, your dismounted drill, you know. And then you had some MOS training on artillery and things of this nature. But it was minimum. And then... Uh, 
I guess my basic training come when I instructed in basic training down Camp Shelby after we was mobilized. And that, well, when were you? When was the 38th mobilized? Well, you know, uh, the 38th Division was mobilized on the 17th of January, 1941, just 11 months, something like that, before Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. Then we were sent us down to Camp Shelby, Mississippi. And then, you know, in, in uh, latter part of September of, of 40 is when they passed the draft right. by one vote of Congress. <laughs> and, uh, and then they, so we filled up with <clears throat> what they like to call selectives. So when you sure. get bait, it wasn't the draft. They didn't like being called draftees. They liked, and, and I agree with them because they volunteered to go, and they could choose the units that they wanted to go to. So we had many, many from Montgomery County and, and Indiana that chose the 38th Division at Camp Shelby, Mississippi. So we gave them. They come right direct to us. And in fact, all of the first part of the World War II, we gave our units gave their basic training. Right and their advanced individual training, actually. Uh, now, you, you said that, <clears throat> were you a little short of manpower when you first were called, that is, as far as the division was concerned? What, is it, about 38,000 people? Was well, no, the division back in those days, as you got to recall, it was a Tri square, a square division. Well, you were square. We was a square division what? back in that day. When did they change them trying to? We changed, we had a change in our MOS, uh, or our TONE, in the, right after Pearl Harbor, in the first part of uh, January, February, March of 1942. Well, that, that's odd. I, <clears throat> I was with the 4th Infantry Division in, uh, in Georgia, <clears throat> and uh, at that time we were already triangularized. Of course, course you've got to remember too, Doc, the 4th right. Division was the regular Army Division, that's true. and they changed the regular Army Divisions into the Triangle Division before back in the early 40s. Mm -hmm. and. They, we were mobilized, uh, the National Guard, the 18 National Guard divisions and uh, equivalent of enough to make another 20 divisions plus uh, we didn't have any Army Air, or no Air Force at that time and they mobilized 19, uh, 19 observation squadrons out of the National Guard that went right into the Army. And we were mobilized for one year and to serve on and not to be served outside the continental U.S. other than U.S. territory. And so the, the government and uh, especially the regular army, because there's always a little bit of a friction between the regular army and the reserve components, as you well know. And so uh, they mobilized or they triangulized the, the regular army division, but they said, well, what the heck, let's don't waste money on the National Guard division. They're, big old unyielding square divisions that we fought in in World War I. So let's keep them that way because they're going out in a year anyway and let's concentrate our equipment and our energy to the units that's all right. Now, 139 field artillery battalion, of which you remember, <coughs> you, at the, when you were square division, there were four of those battalions, were there not? Did you drop one then? Well, uh, back when in, before we triangulize, see a square division is made up of fours. You know, you had four infantry regiments, and we had two uh, light artillery regiments, which 139th was uh, a regiment at that time, 139th field artillery regiment, and B Barry was in the first battalion uh, of the regiment. And then, uh, of course, you had regiments, uh, uh, the quartermaster, supply, uh, your your medical regiment, and each regiment had their own band. Well, it, it changed considerably yeah, after the letter had war came. Right. Okay. <coughs> now, when did you start receiving your selectees? Uh, it's we start, uh, I would say, of course, when we got down, we stayed at home station here at Crawfordsville, our local oh. unit. Stayed at, uh, at Crawfordsville uh, from seven to ten days and to get your shots and your records and, and uh, separate the people with the extreme hardships and uh, the normal administrative. Uh, and, and then, uh, we, in fact, uh, we slept some. But normally we slept at home. And I can recall some of the ladies' clubs in Providence got together and 
the government gave an excellent number of, of cents, it wasn't dollars for each meal. Yeah. And over in the Masonic Temple, they all the ladies' clubs in Providence, or many of the ladies' clubs got together and uh, formed an organization, and they cooked the meal, and the government gave, gave them the money, and it was some of the best cooking, well, better than our GI cook. <laughs> But you know, it's sort of odd that you get them down to Camp Shelby. <clears throat> then when we had mobilized, is that uh, we drove our trucks and pulled our French 75 howitzer. If you remember the old French 75 howitzer that World War I made famous. Right. And we pulled those back of just, uh, uh, well, we got some real new trucks, 37, 38 GMCs and four-wheel drives. But most, most of the other wheel vehicles were older. And we took us three days to drive down to Camp Shelby. And interesting note, Ned Rickett was a, was a second lieutenant at that time, and he's our motor officer. Nice. And he was in charge of the motor movement going down there. And I was in the driver's section. In fact, I drove for Ned uh, in the battery commander, uh, my first assignments there. And uh, what was your rank? That, uh, my rank was a recruit. <laughs> Well, I take it back. Is, is I my rank was private because yeah. the recruit was a recruit for the first ninety right. days, and then you draw twenty one dollars a month. Then after you're there ninety days, you got uh, a private, and then we got thirty dollars a month. And then a PFC got uh, thirty five oh, or so. something like that, thirty six, as I recall. But it wasn't that much more. <laughs> I know when two or three. Uh, years later, I was a corporal and I got $54 a month, and my golly, I had money burning <laughs> <laughs> in my pocket. But you know, an odd, interesting thing, if we got enough tape, oh, and, okay, okay, and you got well. enough time, but uh, the other units in the division uh, took trains down that weren't uh, to Camp Shelby, mm -hmm. and we had a train accident with our, one of our units, and it was interesting because we Back in those days, instead of having the, well, the 1937 field ranges that we fought with or we had during the fighting World War II, we had the, the field range that was low on the ground in a square metal box. Yes. And the hinges would fold up flat for transportation. But that's the only thing, and you would uh, fuel it with wood or coal or whatever you could find in that nature that would burn. And we cooked in the baggage car going to Camp Shelby, our units did, and they put a square box of sand in the baggage car, put this this sole over the floor, and that uh, I, it had to be a young cook because I couldn't I couldn't get down there and do the <laughs> cooking on the floor. But on this train wreck, one of our cooks uh, when it turned over this hot stove come and burn across the, the rear end, and it, it uh, but we didn't. I think uh, our unit we didn't lose any. But that was sort of interesting going down there, and, and it's, uh, it only took a couple of days for the train to get down. Going back a little of the history of you were there in World War I, neither was I, but actually the, the 38th Division of World War I also trained at Camp Joe Shelby, did they not? Right. In fact, uh, uh, Camp Shelby, Mississippi is the birthplace of the, of the 38th and, Division. And it's called what? What the cyclone that was, now tell us about and, that. And, well, in August of 1917, is the 38th Division, uh, they was mobilizing for World War I. Right. And we had the old 1st and 4th Infantry and the other National Guard units in Indiana, and they were ordered as an infantry unit to, to go down to Camp Shelby and train as infantry. Right. And, you know, we just got back from the Mexican Border. Right. And so <clears throat> on the way down there, the regimental commander of the, the old 4th Infantry got orders that you were changed now to the 139th Field Artillery Regiment and you will be part of the 38th Division dated 15 of August 1917. And the 139th First uh, Regimental Commander was uh, uh, Robert Tin, uh, uh, correction, Robert Moorhead. And in fact, uh, I served with Colonel Moorhead's father was a division commander before I was. Uh, Robert G. Moorhead was a division commander right immediately before me, and I served as his assistant division commander. And it was sort of interesting, but <clears throat> tell us about the cycle. Okay, we got down to Shelby, and uh, 
Uh, you, you do the division. The division, the, the, uh, the, the, well, of course, you got thing too is is they they took the divisions and scattered right before they left Indiana and scattered them out. And for the old 139th, the majority of the unit they formed the 150th Field Artillery Regiment, and the majority of those men that was in this, and they're all men in the National Guard at that time, no no females, mm -hmm. and they took this the units from the 139th and formed the 150th and sent them directly to ETO over France to fight with the 42nd Division, which General Douglas MacArthur commanded the Rainbow Division. The Rainbow Division. So this is part of the Rainbow Division. Our history of the artillery and the 38th Division goes to the France at that time. And then the rest of them went down to Camp Shelby, Mississippi and mobilized and when we was down there and nothing but mud and tents and uh, horses and, and the pack mules and things we had to, the artillery was pulled uh, the French 75 pulled by horses and uh, so a cyclone comes through or a high wind a hurricane or, or whatever it might be but they called it a cyclone a cyclone comes through and, and tore up just about all the tents in the division. And we was fishing around for names at that time. And so, or they were, the division was. And uh, they come up with the cyclone division. And I've got, uh, uh, and that's called, that's why we have the, the triangle patch, the shield tape shaped patch with the blue and the red, the blue for the infantry, the red for the artillery with a CY in the middle for Cyclone. Right. And that's the way we got our name, the Cyclone Division. But, uh, well, that, that's, that's interesting. Do you know were, were any personnel that had heard the, that time you heard about that? Is, I've had a lot of uh, clippings out of the Hattiesburg uh, paper, mm -hmm. and there's too, not too many killed, and, and I, I don't really think it was other than a high Just wind. A high. Okay. That's good. Well, I, of course, uh, Shelby is sort of your, as you say, your birthplace. <coughs> but later, he did train at Camp Greeley, Michigan. Now, was this after World War II that he, you did that? Yes. Uh, <coughs> Greeley, Michigan, the first year we went to Camp Greeley, Michigan, that's the National Guard troops after we mobilized back into the reserve components in 1951, the first year we went to Camp Greeley, okay. Michigan to train. <coughs> But, but, but you know, you get back to, to mobilization, and, and you mentioned they, of course, World War One, and, and, and that's true, it is uh, we uh, here had just got rid of our horses a couple of years before I joined up. And uh, I can recall now when I was a youngster, when I was a kid, not a youngster, and, and seeing the, the members on their horses in uniform and riding around, and they the French 75 bow by horses, and we still had so much of our horse equipment. And we, we still had the World War I uniform, as you recall. Yes, when the, we went in. the rat leggings. Well, we had rat leggings, and then the artillery had, had the uh, canvas leggings with leather inside where they ride for riding horses. horses. Yeah. And then the officers had their riding boots and the pinks and the greens and and the campaign hat, you know, those smoky bear hats, and the uh, our steel pot was the old World War One uh, <coughs> flat saucer type pot. You know, interesting thing. We lived on East Main Street when I was well seven years old. <coughs> I can remember that the National Guard, the battery here was alerted. This now this may have been for the Mexican thing, but they went up to the Vandalia Railroad and loaded on cars up there to go south. And I, they may have gone to Shelby at that time. What year was that? Well, it had to be 17. Oh, could be, very likely could have been, yeah. Mm -hmm. We had a, an old gentleman here from Crowdersville, and I wish I could think of his first name, his last name, Green, that had uh, Green Acres and all yeah, that. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. that, that was his property out there. Right. Mm -hmm. And he went down to the Mexican border war, and uh, in 1916 and then with the division in 1917 to Shelby and he gave me a lot lot of clippings and pictures uh, in that day. Uh, one interesting note too 
it is when we would mobilize, of course we emptied everything out of our supply rooms and they talk about gas masks now, or protective masks as we call them, and uh, uh, when we emptied supply, we, we had two gas masks, that's all we had, but they were for the horses. They were horse gas masks from World War One. So, so you see, we uh, emphasize that because we did take care of our animals. Absolutely. Well, you wouldn't be very mobile if you didn't have horses. No, all those guns. In fact, the horses had gas masks and the men didn't in a lot of cases. Now, as an artillery, I want to ask you a little about Army. Now, as I recall, in our division, we had three battalions of 105 millimeter. Now, were they howitzers? Uh, 105 is a howitzer, right? Okay. Now the one five fives. Well, it, it's a howitzer. A howitzer also. Now the now, long, now we had a, a one five five gun, and you're probably getting ready to say that now on the yeah long, the gun. Long, 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 yeah, yeah. Was this a longer barrel? Was it that was a longer barrel, higher muzzle velocity, and lower trajectory. The idea of a howitzer is it goes up and comes down like it, so it can get behind the hills and sort of like a mortar. Right? I mean, well, well, a mortar. Yeah. That's like a mortar, mm -hmm. and a, a gun fires a flat trajectory, and if this hill mask is here and that anybody's over here is safe because to clear this hill mask at a flat trajectory, it'll go beyond any more person over here. But if we're an howitzer, we'll go up and come down. That's the main difference between a howitzer and a gun. Now, our cannon company had a little short barrel. Were those also howitzer? Uh, and were they 105s or were they 75s? Both. Well, we, we had the, the uh, 75. <coughs> The cannon company to begin with had 57s. 57s? Yeah. 57s. Now, is that a 57? That was a 57 and a tank gun, see. And and then uh, the tank company had 57 and a tank gun. I'm not sure what tank company you had, but we had the the 75 for for uh, tank company. And then once the 105 come in the American inventory in 1942, is uh, then they change that to the 105. Well, now, I'm thinking about a 37 millimeter. What kind of gun was that? A 37 millimeter. Now, we had some towed and a tank, 37 millimeters. Well, our anti tank companies, I think. Yeah, oh, yes. Uh, well, uh, I jumped ahead there and I said 57s. We started with the 37s in it, and they were pulled back of a, of a truck. A, a truck. We'd say a three quarter gun yeah. now, but they, they were just a civilian type truck then. And then we graduated into the 57 mm. Were those effective at all against armor? No. I mean, well, the armor we had back in those days were not that great. Yeah. And, and, uh, well, but a tank, uh, tank, even a 57 would paint, it would ping off of, yeah, ping off of anything that, uh, we, that we had even. Yeah. And the uh, enemy had just as good armor as we did. Well, that, that's interesting. I think uh, <clears throat> we people who were not in the artillery it's good to know about the armament and uh, what uh, I think you've given an expert to tell us about. I we really thank you for that. Okay, now, <clears throat> when did you start? Of course, you did start uh, small unit training once down at Shelby. When did you start doing, acting as a division? Uh, uh, 17th of January, the day we mobilized. Well, no, it is, uh, well you think there, there, there are more to a division, a fighting division, than they being able to, to fight. You gotta coordinate well, and that the reason you've got to coordinate, coordinate the motor movement, coordinate the commanders. And this is what was started right off the bat when it was always went along and that's where it gives the reserve components division, the National Guard Division, a uh, leg up on the others because we are used to doing this coordination. Right. And they figured the motor movements and the train movements and things of this nature that take us to Shelby so you're Coordination and the beach command started there, but then just as soon as we got to Camp Shelby, Mississippi, is is the same as in World War One. The camp was not completed because, as they said, they only passed the draft law in, in uh, latter part of September 1940, right. and uh, just a few months later that uh, we started going in. And in fact, they started our first National Guard divisions, our first National Guard troops. Reported for duty, 64,000 on reported for duty, not Shelby, but other stations, mm -hmm. on the 16th of September, 1940. On the 27th of August of 1940 is when they said we're going to mobilize the National Guard to prepare us for it. Which our country leaders knew we were going to get in a war. Yeah, but, but to get back to your question, Don, <laughs> it, it is yes, just as soon as we got down there, we, first of all, we started 
cutting trees and, and making the wooden uh, walkways and, and things of this nature. And uh, some of our, our, our latrine wasn't done, our day room wasn't done. Our kitchen was finished up on cement stilts, of course, uh, and uh, wooden. But uh, and by the time it was, uh, I'd say within a week or two, we started getting these selectees in. Mm -hmm. And we, when we went to Camp Shelby, we were at about 50% to own each strength. And a uh, month that we got down there, we were 100% stream. Now, did the selectees primarily come from the central states, or were they, uh, were they also the East Coast? Our initial selectees we got was almost all from Indiana. Right. In fact, our, our battalions is almost all from Montgomery County. Uh, we had, I think, the farthest way, as I can recall now, was maybe uh, home, uh, up in the Gary area. The I see. I we got a few from up there, but most of them right here in central Indiana. <coughs> but of course, the, uh, the motor movements and the maneuvers and all that, uh, was, well, we all remember that, but now in 40, I think that's when they really started uh, uh, training as corps and army. Is that right? Did, did you know? Well, now, now we started uh, giving our selectees and ourselves, really, yeah. uh, but uh, a basic training, just integrated it in with our other trainings, sure. their advanced individual training, and all right there at the group at the sure. battery. And uh, we, we trained there, and then in well, let's see, 51 years ago today, we were on the biggest landmass maneuvers, the largest maneuvers that's ever held Tell us about. by the United States. <coughs> it's uh, on western Louisiana and, and eastern Texas in the Sabine River Valley maneuvers of August and September of 90, uh, 41. Uh, by the way, I think you said 93, and this is 92 when you're opening. Did I say 93? I, I don't know. But just in case you did, let's, 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 let's go get another year. <laughs> but, but back in, uh, maybe some of my years might be all too, but being a year off is not that, our age is not that bad, you know. But uh, uh, we was preparing, and we went, uh, and we're pitted one army, the third army, against the Second Army, as I recall now, but I'm sure it was second, I'm fairly sure. And uh, we, at one time, our division, the Third Army, and we wore the red armband. Other times, in the same maneuvers, then we changed sides blue. and then used blue. And everybody had to wear one of the armbands. And it was a, it was a, a, a free maneuver. Uh, and what I mean by that is you can move anywhere in that area that your tactical situation deemed it necessary. I, uh, we could go down in the artillery battalion or artillery battery, and we, for the for the scheme of the maneuver, we decided to go in this farmer's woods or his barn lot. We, if they had fences, and most of them didn't have fences down there, you know, we could go right through there and occupy without any further uh, any additional issue. <laughs> and it was just a free maneuver up and down from down uh, old Lake Charles and the southern part of where the hurricane went through Louisiana and Lafayette, on up through Leedsville, and on up to, through Alexander and, and Shreveport up in that area. Well, in, in August, August of 41, I, I was a medical officer for a, a smoke company. Now, their whole main purpose, was, I think, was to make it look like artillery smoke, but it might have been protective device too, I think. But we didn't do much maneuvering as I remember. But you know, Doc, this, this 41 maneuver probably done more for the defense of the United States and getting us up. See, this was prior to Pearl Harbor. Yes, indeed. And, and we uh, we had World War I equipment. We went on this maneuver with 1934 Chevrolet recon cars for the command instead of Jeep. We went in there in 1935 and 37 Chevrolet and Dodge trucks. That was just a regular uh, civilian truck, a two-wheel drive, and with a, a metal bed put on it and a canvas on bowls with a, a lunette ring in the back or a pillow in the back for your houser. And we, but then we did get uh, uh, four, two Dodges and two, uh, two 1938. GMC 21939 Dodges, that was four-wheel drive, that we pulled the 
the French 75 with. But this was our equipment. We still had the World War I uh, saucer helmet, steel helmet. We still had the... Did you bring the, one of those? Yeah. Uh, we still had the the old World War I saucer helmet, and this is probably one that I wore back in that maneuver, actually. And uh, if you can see, it doesn't protect anything. It sits on your head, and, and uh, I don't even think that'd deflect a, a ball. But, and we had the, the infantry had the wrap leggings, we had the wool uh, breeches, and, uh, and then a lot of the hot as a devil, and we had the wool shirt, the blanket wool shirt, yeah, uh, for there. And our fatigue uniforms were blue denim if we was lucky enough to have fatigue uniforms. I remember, uh, since we didn't have any tanks that time, they had two and a half ton trucks with broomsticks sticked up the sides to represent guns. Yeah. And uh, wasn't that bad? We well, you know, this one, of, and I'm glad you brought that up because what I was mentioning at the time and, and, uh, is we improvised. We made yeah. cannons and tank, just tank, uh, and a tank guns out of stove pipes, logs, right. and uh, we had umpires there, and the umpires would recognize that as a, a 57 millimeter and tank gun, what that gun was capable of doing. And if a, a vehicle come there and he shot at him, that vehicle was out. Oh, was out. See? And uh, uh, we we still cooked on those stoves on the ground. And uh, but the thing of it is, is we had a lot of newsreel coverage of that. Mm -hmm. Much, much newsreel coverage. I can recall that our division command section, we was a. Uh, moving so fast and they by hook or by crook i don't know how they got it but they got taxi cabs they hired taxi cabs and you would be out there on maneuver and you see a green or yellow or red taxi cab going down there and that's some of our division staff and they wondered how we could maneuver so fast and get with the equipment we had and uh, i still wonder to this day where it come from but early. okay now let's go on in time uh were you, you were part of the Tennessee maneuvers later when you who Ben Lear was there? No, no, I was right. right. See, we went down to the 41 maneuvers in Louisiana, the yeah. Sabine yeah. River Valley, and then we went on the 42 maneuvers, almost the same location. Oh, okay. And then we come back from the uh, 42 maneuvers, and we were ready to be, that was about the same about uh, August, September of 1942, 50 years ago, and we were ready to go over to Europe. And uh, were, we, were, were you alerted at that time? We were alerted at that time and we uh, we were assigned to take amphibious training yeah. down at Camp Carabelle, Florida. And, and we, Gordon Johnson. It, 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 but it is now, yeah. but, but, or it was later on. Well, but later. The first name well, we, we followed you down. Camp Carabelle because it's close to Camp Carabelle. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so we got through with the 42 maneuvers and we had to wait uh, I think about four weeks before we were scheduled in for Carabao and uh, we slept no bedrolls at that time and that fall of the year in Louisiana it gets cold and uh, first experience of me with the bedroll I went to PX and I bought my first bedroll before they was issued to anybody mm -hmm. and I think I paid three dollars and fifty cents for it and it was something that you love not but, but so we went from 42 maneuvers and then the majority of the division, now we sent some of the 151st Infantry, which was a Darlington unit with a D company, to uh, Fort Benning, Georgia for instruction and school troops. Mm -hmm. And the rest of us, we went to uh, Caravel, Florida and took amphibious training. Well, now here again, you say you eventually trained the guys, is that right? Yeah. So, the 151st Infantry, you lost that regiment out of your... No, no, we see, uh, they came back. What it was, when we was mobilized, we had four infantry regiments, yeah. and it's built around that. Yeah. We had the 151st and 152nd Infantry Regiment from Indiana. Okay. We had the 150th Infantry Regiment from West Virginia. Uh -huh. And the 149th Infantry Regiment from Kentucky. That's it. Well, that's so. I want so our 38th Division at that time was made up of uh, Indiana, primary Indiana, Kentucky, and West Virginia. The division headquarters was here in 
in Indiana. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then when we mobilized, and all these units went with us, and we filled up, and we trained, and we went through the 41 maneuvers with a, a square division. Mm -hmm. and, uh, a military man can re recall and can visualize uh, the youngster. They can't visualize the the many many problems that's in a square division versus a triangle. Oh, I mean, they, they can. As, as you all know, our tactics are primarily two up and one back. You might say, you know, two up and one reserve. So that's what in uh, in February March of uh, 1942, right after Pearl Harbor, is when they decide, well, we're going to need them. Let's get them up to modern uh, organizations. So they triangulized us, and what we uh, what you end up with? we we ended up with the 151st Infantry Regiment, the 152nd Infantry Regiment, and the 149th Infantry Regiment from Kentucky. From Kentucky. Yes. So we had two Indian, and now our our field artillery regiments was was no longer. This they were in the uh, then we went battalion. So. The 139th Field Artillery Regiment, we took part of it, yeah. the 1st Battalion, 139th, which was us, become the 139th Field Artillery Battalion. Okay. And then the 2nd Battalion, 139th Field Artillery Regiment, become the 163rd Field okay. Artillery okay. Battalion. Okay. And if you start to look at that, you can take that 139 and 163 and, mm -hmm. and turn the, and make guide on it and, and, uh, for the 163rd. <laughs> and what was the 3rd? Uh, well, and then they, we, we took one of the, the Kentucky 138th Field Artillery Regiment, we kept one of those battalions and made the 138th Field Artillery Battalion, and then the others, the excess, went and formed new units mm -hmm. at that time, uh, uh, or helped form new units. And you know, when an interesting fact it is, in 19, 1st September 1939, when Hitler invaded Poland, Hitler and their short-lived ally, yeah. Russia invaded Poland, we had three divisions the United States Army. We were the 17th largest uh, unit, uh, mm -hmm. army in the world, 17th. In the war's end, we, the United States Army went up to 91 divisions, from three to 91 divisions, which is super common. Yeah. And it, it just, uh, uh, and it's not all the military as we know, it, it's your civilian industries oh. and all the people work to overtime and double time and all this to, to help produce the war of goods. Oh. And I, it's, uh, well, we, we, it proved how strong the United States is. You know, is. as a matter of fact, Bob and these oral recitations, we're, we're having people who did work in war industry, uh, that sort of thing. I and think we're the support these people. It, because it, they were just as important as the guys on the it, you know, Rosie the Riveter and, and yeah, the other. That's uh, right. Uh, and first started the the female working in plants. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, those things are. Well, now what was that question you asked me? I don't. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't have. Okay. Well, I I want to know. Yeah. But now we're getting this alert. Was this the first and only time you were alerted? I'm, the reason I'm saying that is fourth division was alerted three different times. Well, of course, you know, this time, well, when we went to Caraval, I was a corporal. The corporals don't know much. <laughs> and, and then later on, the sergeant. So I really, and I searched through the history, and uh, uh, we were declared ready for combat on maneuvers. And we finished the 42 maneuvers. Okay. And we had, we had the, the Triangle Division. We were training in there, and we maneuvered with the Triangle Division. We had new equipment, the, the modern equipment. We had the, the present day, or the American 105, which we still have in the United States inventory, right, to this, this day, with a few modifications on it that doesn't change the accuracy or anything. We still have some of the other artillery pieces, and so we needed the amphibious training, right, for amphibious land. So we scheduled to go to Camp Shelby, or Camp Carabell, sure. Florida. We went down there and finished the amphibious training, and we were scheduled to go to Europe on the Queen Mary. And that's when the Queen Mary got hit by a mine or whatever it might have been and disabled it for a few weeks there. Mm -hmm. And my golly, here we were at Camp Carabell, Florida. We were completed our, our, our training, and we were waiting waiting for, and see, the Queen Mary would take almost a whole division yes, and uh, to take us to, to Europe. And uh, 
And they had the 28th Division, which was Camp Livingston, Louisiana at that time, scheduled to come in for amphibious training. So uh, I can see those wheels turning and visualize some of the decision making. And uh, so they decide, well, okay, 38th and 28th, you change places. 38th, you leave your equipment here. <clears throat> 28th, you leave your equipment at Camp Livingston, Louisiana. And of course, we sent the, the supply people and the liaison and enter and sign for the equipment, things like that. So each division loaded on train, uh, troop train. We at Carabao, Florida, and then at Livingston, Louisiana, and we met on the troop train, and we took over their equipment at that time at Camp Livingston, Louisiana. All right. And so then we continued. Uh, all this time, uh, any of the uh, divisions, we lost cattery after cattery. We were there and maybe we were we were declared ready and, and we were scheduled to go. Then all at once the ch plans were changed, maybe we was delayed. So they pulled out uh, sometimes you five six people, people uh, percent. And uh, and they pulled out some of some of our very best people mm -hmm. and some of our orders too. <laughs> but <laughs> it, it, it depends on where they asked for them, a number and name, or right. whether we had a chance to send who we wanted to. You know what, how that goes. Okay. But but we lost cattery after cattery right. all over this okay. time. Now you're in Livingston, Louisiana. Now now we're okay with Livingston, Louisiana, and that's right close to Manuring area actually. Yeah, right. And uh, that's right outside of Alexander, Louisiana, right. and we train there. And then in 1943, the latter part of 43, is when we boarded ship at New Orleans in the wool uniform. And uh, I can recall that, Doc, and, and, uh, but as a sergeant, but as a staff sergeant this time, and they say, everything you've got has got to go in that duffel bag. Nothing. That's it. I accept your weapons and things yeah. this nature, your gas mask and your steel pot. But uh, so, and they said, they, uh, we had to get rid of all of our shaving cream, shaving lotions, anything that would smell uh, would distract the, you know, would give you a wave to some of the enemy. And, and, and so it should have gave us an indication that we'd go in the Pacific then. But we loaded the, the, the troop ships in wool uniform, and we thought, well, here, here we come. And we went out through the Gulf of Mexico and down, and then instead of going, out in the Atlantic, instead of going toward Europe, we turned right, turned south, went down through the Panama Canal, mm -hmm. and it just so happened the the 150th Infantry from West Virginia, that was part of the 38th Division, and each regiment had a band at that time, and the, their band was stationed in Panama, and the 150th Regimental band, still with the CY on the drums and all that, or the band that played Welcome Muscles through the Panama Canal. We were the largest convoy that's ever gone through the Panama Canal. Is that right? Your, your divisional part of each. Any other with supporting troops too? Or well, uh, there's supporting ships, you know, and yeah. that. Well, now, uh, now, yes. now, so you're taking out across the Pacific. Did you stop? With the we Hawaii? stopped at Hawaii. We stopped at Hawaii for uh, eight months, give or take a few days. Well, we was there on the, on coastal defense. That was still when it was pretty hot in, in Hawaii, and we'd ride on the main island of Oahu. Yeah. And uh, they put us out for coastal defense, and then they uh, said, and now we'll give you a jungle, jungle, training. jungle survival training. Oh, yeah. And they had, a, a, I think we probably one of the first classes or go through it, and it was a hell of a class. I mean, <laughs> I'll tell you, it was. It did us a lot of good, and I was sure thankful that I was young. And, and uh, But you know, Carabelle, Florida got us probably in better physical shape than any other, because we double time all the time from one place to the other on that sand. You remember Dog Island? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I made, a, I made, I bet you I made 200 uh, landings there on Dog Island. And in fact, uh, right before Christmas in 1940, Yeah, yeah, and right for that we the Navy or it wasn't the Navy Army because all the landing craft no, was, was made by were handled by the Army, you know, yeah. Army yeah. Amphibious Corps, and they fouled up and they didn't make a good landing on Dog Island. And Christmas Day, 42, the division commander made them make another landing there. 
Oh, I think everybody was really, uh, oh, they weren't too happy. All right, now we're in Hawaii. Uh, when did you then take on, and what was your next plan? Well, then we, uh, after coastal defense and the amphibious training and all in Hawaii, uh, and most, but most of it was out there in the last month, they brought us in the Schofield Barracks, and so they gave us some easy living before we went on over. Uh, got boarded on a little 500 foot Dutch liner, our battalion did. And it was rough water. I got, most people got seasick, including myself, before we even got out of Pearl Harbor. <laughs> but then we went to New Guinea. New Guinea. New Guinea, and we uh, went in down around Buna area. Uh, I'm sort of, I'm searching, I'm searching the memory now. So it's been 50 years. Buna and, and Oro Bay. Uh, you, you know, it's odd that uh, I, I can recall them both, but I can't recall well, I'm both in the same area, I think. But you did, you went to New Guinea before we went to the Philippines. Yes, right? we went to New Guinea, and, uh, uh, and, and you know, it's, uh, we took the the jungle training yeah. there. Uh, that was really, really, I mean, the, for, for the, what do they call it, Kanai grass? Was that the whole, oh, yeah, the jungle, jungle grass, and, and uh, what uh, other stuff? I bet you know, a local man, one of the finest officers I've ever served with is Ned Rickett. And he was sent down to uh, uh, New Guinea early to take the really intensive jungle, jungle training up in the Old Stanley Mountains with the Australians up there and uh, live off the land. I mean, 100% off the land, which most of it was. He got bad, bad malaria and he got fever. bad malaria and he, and, and I can recall as if it was yesterday and come back to the battalion and uh, then he was shipped back. Uh, well, he was a bad shit. shit. Yes, he was. And he weighed what, around 100 pounds or something, didn't he? Well, that's something like that. And I just, uh, uh, I thought it's worthy because Ned, is a fine individual and I mm -hmm. yeah, hell of a good officer. And okay, now when was your first combat? Bob? Well, we had a you little. Uh, uh, you, did you have your first combat with the 38th? It was yes, the 38th with the yeah. other war. Uh, we had a little bit of mopping up and some engagements in New Guinea. In New Guinea. Okay. And uh, of course, New Guinea is where they had the, we had right knee headhunters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the Australians was, see, it was Australian, was, uh, is their territory, New Guinea. Sure. And they was, you know, it's a funny thing in New Guinea, they, they put a bounty on Japanese heads, mm -hmm. the Australians did. And so they would bring them up to our division headquarters and turn in a head and, and collect so much money. And, uh, boy. and this one old boy, uh, New Guinea, fuzzy wuzzy, as we call him. <clears throat> come up there and every week he'd bring two or three heads. Just almost clockwork. And he'd get his bounty and, and go back. And, and finally our intelligent people, our G2 section, thought, well, what's going on here? You know, he comes. And they followed him. And there, in the back of his hut there, back in the boondock, in the jungles, is he had a pen out back of his of his hut that had Japanese in it. And when he'd get low on money or, or whatever the bounty was, money didn't mean anything. He would chop off a head and take it up or two and collect bounties. But then uh, but then we uh, uh, left when we New Guinea then in uh, oh, 44, latter part of 44 November, I would guess October, November 44 when we, November, when we went into to Lady and went into the, the Philippines, the Lower Island, the Philippines, went in Lady, Lady Gulf, Lady Gulf, Lady Gulf, and, uh, and, uh, and then uh, I, that was probably one of the most scariest operations I ever went in on, because we started, uh, old 100 mile out, we started getting these Japanese suicide planes, and they would, kamikaze, and they would, uh, hit us and I know on our ship one of them hit our superstructure a ship with his wingtip and flipped around and landed in the water but several of our people got killed right there by the kamikaze pilots but and then so we went into Lady 
and we offloaded off the ship. We were combat loaded up to a point, but not ready for an amphibious landing. Yeah. And we offloaded off the ship at night or the wee hour of the morning. No, no moon, no oh, star. LCTs or uh, well, we had LCMs and uh, LCT and, and LCTs. No, I'll say those are landing craft. A landing craft mechanized or landing craft tank. tank right. And then uh, are we. Well, we had LCP and LCVs and yeah. landing craft vehicles, but we we were in a. Uh, you could put the four howitzers, which we had in the battery, mm -hmm. in an LCT, uh, LC. Yeah, T. T. I'm not sure whether it's an M or T, but it was a. It, was a, it had to be a T yeah. with a front end ramp that comes clear down. That's what I'm. And and sure. then uh, uh, and then we. And then the recons, which I went in, I was with the recons, uh, the battery, and I went in on an LCM. And if you can imagine, offloading off of that ship on cargo nets, no light, uh, no stars, no moon or anything, and fully combat loaded, and going down that cargo net and stepping in that. Uh, hey, I'll tell you, I was scared. Don't think I wasn't. And then went in, hit land, and then we. Now, did, you, well, did you have? Was this Lady Gulf? Did you have to push the Japs back from? The no, is uh, at that time uh, it was oh a week or so old, and the, the beachheads were were pretty clear. pretty clear. Mm -hmm. I mean, fairly much so. Yeah, uh, we had a, and I can't even recall the airstrip right, right south of Tacloban, I uh, in the on Lady that we had to go and take and. Uh, and it was a, a pretty uh, good fighting there. Okay, now uh, you were in how many engagements there personally? Uh, three. Three on, uh, in on the Philippines. Philippines. Or no, no, two in Philippines. Well, I, uh, three, when did I, you go to OCS? Well, then uh, I left the the unit on the 17th of January of 44, 45. 45, oh yeah. And, and, uh, uh, actually, four years after we had mobilized, and, and uh, fact, when we were in New Guinea, I was almost, well, I wasn't, I was told I'd go to go to OCS, apply for OCS, and, and uh, on uh, Lady, uh, after we back in the rest area, it, they said uh, I had to go to OCS, and I said, well, do I have any options? See, I was put in for a combat commission. And uh, Carl DeBarge, remember DeBarge, was our battalion commander, and he said, he said, uh, certainly he said that within 24 hours after we hit the beach, we'll have your commission. The paperwork was done off. And then come down to the 8th Army, said that uh, had to go to OCS, and we was changed army up in here in the 5th Army, as I recall. And they said uh, the 5th Army didn't want to resend the 8th Army order, so they said, you go on down. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got... Uh, so we were loading up, started loading for the Luzon invasion at that time, and uh, so I they got me the heck out of there so I wouldn't be in their way, you know. And you went to Australia? Yeah, I went took off from that club at about four o'clock in the morning, and we had the old Japanese Betty's following our bombers back in up there, mm -hmm. and uh, there we got bombed and strafed on the, that morning. I left, and I thought, well, what did we get? And it, uh, well, you know, I said I had a, a brother uh, that was two years old tonight that served with us all this time. And he was our battalion command sergeant major. And he's the one that took me up to, took uh, the ones that went to OCS, uh, two or three hours out, mm -hmm. out of the division. Went. But we got down to Australia probably about two weeks before we were scheduled to report because of the. Uh, operations up and getting ready for the Luzon campaign. And so we got together, about 10 or 12 of us there going to the field artillery OCS that was in Brisbane and said, well now we want to go out and report now. Of course you get free room and board and all or we want to just take a little vacation. <laughs> and we all decided we'd just take a little vacation. And uh, we went to uh, USO it was a summer resort out south of Brisbane, which is called Surface Paradise now. It was uh, Kulangata at that time, and it was right at the fall of the year, and the, the, the summer 
people have gone, but that beach was beautiful and almost vacant. And uh, uh, so we went out there, and it cost us uh, 32 cents, which is a shilling a day for room and board. <laughs> that was three meals, and I mean, the meals was family style and, and uh, big steaks that uh, oh. never saw before. And, and uh, all the milk I wanted to drink, and that's what I drank a lot of. And, and it was. <clears throat> Well then, uh, was it 13 weeks? Uh, no, it was 17 weeks. 17 weeks. 17 weeks, OCS. And then you were commissioned a second lieutenant artillery, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And then, then where did you go? Then I went back up to the Philippines and I uh, joined the 43rd. I was assigned to the 43rd Division, which was a neighbor division with the 38th. Uh, 38th was down in the Manila area and north of them was a 43rd division, and sometimes they interlocked with the troop. Was the 43rd the National Guard unit? Yes, the 43rd was a National Guard unit from over the, oh, uh, Rhode Island, that area. Oh, the east, uh, uh, okay. Well, did you, uh, then, then what battalion were you assigned to then? I was assigned to a, a field artillery battalion with the... Well, which Troy. one? Hell, I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was trying to, I was trying to, yeah, isn't that uh, Bell Irish Sanitary? <laughs> yeah, it, it's of course I was assigned to them, and we was we we liberated the several prisoner of war camps where the the death march went from the Ton North, mm -hmm. and where this old boy from the Doga went to. We we liberated, uh, and I can't think of the prisoner of war camp, uh, but. Uh, you know, they tell me the memory is the second thing that goes, and that the memory is already. We, we, uh, we liberated that one and several of the others up north there, and plus a lot of the uh, of fighting. And uh, we then, at that time, once the Luzon campaign wound down, is uh, they started the rotation, more or less. And they, uh, they would rotate the people with higher points that, uh, with, with, that was with overseas service and dependence and things of this nature. I didn't have any dependence, but I had enough time overseas to be rotated back. But, but I, I elected to stay because I thought, uh, well, I, I just want, I like the adventure. Well, well, were you in command of a, of a gun? Uh, no, I was a, <clears throat> started off with motor officer oh, and, and, uh, and then uh, battery exec. Recon officer, take this name with him. Okay, now we're working down to toward. Well, we got through that war in uh, in May. And yeah. VJ Day was uh, considered later. Well, yeah. August was. Yeah, the last part of August. Now, how soon then were you shipped back home? Well, you know, missing a little bit here. That's quite well, interesting. Well, still but when when we the here the the. Uh, and by the way, this this can be documented that later on, uh, here in the last few years, they declassified so many of the war plans and all. And I've got the top secret. I sent got the top secret war plan for the invasion of Japan. And uh, it's quite interesting reading because we were now bear in mind that we rotated a lot of our experienced people back, and we was getting new recruits right yeah. out of basic training. But this time the Army was given basic training yeah. and also the advanced individual training and he'd get right out of Fort Sill and qualified cannoneer or whatever communication man that come with us and come to us maybe 18 years old. Uh, and we had, I would say in our battery we had 60% just new people. But we were scheduled for the invasion of Japan, of the main island on the of Japan. And, uh, uh, and I looked around and the, the new kids we had, of course I was 21 at the time, I had an old hand or 22 maybe, let's see, 22, and, but uh, the new kids were just right on basic training and, and they, or was that 23? <laughs> Mixed up on the date, but anyway, I was born in 22, so let it figure it out. Uh, but uh, we, uh, 
was scheduled and we were briefed on the invasion of Japan. We was given this little handbook that showed the, where we're going in, the high tides, the low tides, and the obstacles of the mayor's name. Where were you at that time? We were in, on Luzon. Luzon. On northern Luzon. Okay. And so I was one of the, as a second lieutenant, second lieutenant, of course, catching most of the details, and I was uh, assigned down to Manila with a group of people to load in our ship. Our ship was in Manila, and I was loading the combat, loading the ship for the invasion of Japan. When they dropped the atomic bomb, I had a crew of, of 22, 24, whatever it was, and we were already started loading our ship uh, for the invasion of Japan. You know, uh, you said they declassified this material, which they did. I, I, we were, I was at Camp Butler, North Carolina, getting ready to get out. And I saw the map, and the 4th Division was listed as one of the invading uh, divisions for, Lusa, for uh, Japan. So we would be right along with the 38th, I mean, my own division. It, it was quite interesting, because I, uh, uh, since we were loading, we were the first division in Japan. Oh, boy. And uh, so... Uh, You've been by like the 29th point, you know. Oh, uh, yeah. At uh, Omaha Beach. Yeah. Uh, well, thank heaven it didn't happen, did it? <laughs> well, then, then all right, now, now you, the, the topic bomb and BJD, so when did you come back there? Then I come back and, uh, and how? Uh, last part of 45, uh, November, oh, okay. uh, 45, they, once, to, once we went in Japan and uh, I got... Oh, you went to Japan? Oh, yes, I, well, since we were, we were combat loading, loading. combat loading, so we just loaded on and went for the occupation job. I see. And so instead of going to the stepping up from the South Island there, we went right into Yokohama and Tokyo Bay there. Mm -hmm. And we offloaded and went, we started securing the airstrips north of Tokyo. I see. And uh, uh, we worked around in that area. Uh, and my golly, is, is I was probably one of the first Americans in, on, at Hiroshima where we dropped the atomic bomb. Mm -hmm. I can recall the first day I was up there. I was, my job as second lieutenant, and I had, I had the motor sergeant drove me because he was a good fighter, and the, and the first sergeant went with me with a 50 caliber machine gun in, in our Jeep, putting on pedestal mount in our mm -hmm. Jeep. And we went around to get these airstrips, or not airstrips, airfields ready for surrender and things of this nature and you know it's 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 interesting is the order was put out the Japanese that it's all propeller almost propeller driven airplane at that time. They've taken the propellers off the airplane and put them in one hangar, taken all their weapons and machine guns and weapons, put one hangar, all the ammunition in the other hangar. So if we went in there there'd be no propellers on on aircraft and no you were an inspector to see the better way. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. and <clears throat> I can recall this great big airfield we went into, military airfield north of Tokyo. And uh, in fact, they had many uh, gliders. They practiced mountain preliminary flight on gliders. And some of our darn idiots got these gliders and launched them and took off. But, and some of them crashed. But anyway, that's beside the point. But uh, they, these are the kind of things that you remember as your experience. But, but this whole, we went into the back of this airfield and drove down the, the taxiway there. Boy, the mechanics work, and they had a, I never saw in combat a four-engine Japanese airplane bomber, mm -hmm. or any other four-engine. And this, within this, was a four-engine aircraft, a bomber, and they were working on the engine, see, and they saw us drive by, and you wouldn't see so much hustling, and they started taking those propellers off right now, and I think while it was four, and that's what our intelligence uh, thought it was, they'd get ready to any of their big shots. They didn't like the agreement, why they'd fly out. Uh -huh. And uh, so I took that. Uh, in fact, uh, the base commander there uh, gave me a, a sword. Uh, this sword, especially, is, is given to me by this one-star general. No, this is a samurai. No, this is just an officer, a Japanese officer. Right? So, and he gave me this sword. Uh, of course, he's doing my keeping anyway. He <laughs> said, I'd like for this to be a personal present for me to you. <laughs> and he gave me this and a little 
Belton Browning, 7.65 Belton Browning, that was a reel that he pulled it out of his drawer. And, and I thought, well, you know, I had a 45 cock and lock on my hip. But there, <laughs> there he, he said that, I thought maybe he's going to shoot me. He said, I want you to take this as a personal gift. And, uh, so, but this is, you can see, is real sharp. Boy, I'll say. And this here is blood on there, and I've never been able to get it off. And it, they really fought with those yeah. things. Didn't now, and this is for the the general soldier. Okay. And this is quite at that time. Uh, well, I was offered five thousand dollars for it. Ever left Japan with it? Boy, I, mean, I should have taken it. <laughs> <laughs> You're uh, talking about uh, Samara swords. This is the old Samara sword that you you see. The this is a enlisted sword, but this is the time that the Japanese. That's a listed smart sword, but it's metal here, and the the fancy the officers had the alligator skin and, and oh, yeah. metal or cloth wrap, mm -hmm. and this is not near as sharp as the other. Mm -hmm. No, but it would you okay. had a <laughs> not for very long. <laughs> and uh, the the uh, Japanese weapons. This is what we call the. Japanese Luger style weapon. Yeah, yeah, it looks like a Luger. It's a uh, nine millimeter, and it's a uh, made before World War II. See, and it's a uh, I got the firing pins and everything out. But and it was made. You carried it in the holster, and your patches, your cleaning equipment, fire spare firing firing pins going there. And then this goes around your neck, and maybe the belt goes around you. Sure your clips. Well, that was just another thing like we have, a set oh, on the belt. Okay. And one of the grandkids must have taken that belt for that more than belt. <laughs> but you, you notice how smooth that is and how good machine that is, yeah. see? Then this weapon was made during the war, same caliber, same usage, but how rough machine that is. See that, how rough that is? Yeah. yeah. And that showed how they was getting desperate towards the end of the war. Uh, just put them together any way they could. Any way they could. And, yeah. What's this other? That a this other sticker. This other was made. We had. It seemed like when we was in Lady, especially, and Luzon, these the youngster kids would start following you around, and you'd sort of halfway adopt them. Uh, this one. Oh, get cigarettes. And chewing oh, cigarettes. And. <laughs> and uh, uh, but anyway, he uh, was, then he, once we got back in the rest area, he came to came your house boy, you know, with raker, raker floor, and, and, or sweeper floor, of course, and, and, uh, and then, uh, in fact, uh, he made this, this uh, dog sticker, but oh, made boy. out of, it's a real good seal, it's but it's handmade. And uh, teak wood and whatever this is, and it says the Philippines, mm -hmm. 1944 that he put on there. Oh, and he and and if you can recall the, I mean, visualize how this is still good. It's not yeah. dry rot or anything. Oh, yeah. And and he gave that to me. And <clears throat> when he was off to, uh, I told him I'd like to have a monkey. And they didn't have any monkeys on Lady and there's neighboring island. They'd go and get me one of those little monkeys. And that's where he was at when I left the film, yeah. because I left in such a hurry. You didn't I've, take always, I've always uh, felt bad that I didn't get a safe, <laughs> a chance to say five to him or anything. Okay, then you, then you came back by, did they fly you back or did you come back by ship? Uh, we come back by ship. The whole division or just? Oh, no, no, just uh, that, well, yes, the, the 43rd Division come back by, by ship from okay. Japan. Mm -hmm. And uh, we came back into uh, to Oakland. Uh, Fort Ord, mm -hmm. and uh, then uh, then the division broke up at Fort Ord, and they were deactivated at the time. Right, mm -hmm. and then they, the people went out separately on troop trains, and I come from uh, uh, Fort Ord to Atterbury, Atterbury and, and separated at Atterbury at that time. What time? What? November of what? Oh boy, November of 45. 45. Well, that, that's about the time I came. Right? Yeah, but it was, of course, 
I don't know about you, they said, do you want to stay in the Officer Reserve Corps, you know? I said, hell no. <laughs> I said, I've had enough. <laughs> and and then, then, then I got, but you're almost in the same breath, I got thinking, and I said, well, I, you know, if you, another war, I'd rather instead of, instead of starting the bottom row all the way up again, mm -hmm. it was, uh, might as well start as a commission officer. Did, did you get a promotion then? Were you first lieutenant for that time? Well, yes, I was first lieutenant for that time, and then, uh, uh, Okay, now, so you're back home, and you've rejoined the, uh, 38th Division, and the 139th, right? Well, not, 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 not that fast, actually. Okay, okay. We, we, uh, in the meantime, I, I met my wife, and we got married in, in 46. I know, yes, we got married in February 46, so see, we, I think she chased me until she caught me, but anyway. <laughs> She'll see you this year. <laughs> and, uh, and then in, uh, we had an organization meeting for the Austin Reserve Corps down at the old army. That's before they mobilized or reactivated the National Guard after World War II. Mm -hmm. And they, they said, would any of you be interested in, in uh, a tour of duty? We need a, a field artillery And uh, I said, well, I said, what, where is it at now? And I said, uh, could I find some information out on it? So he took my name. About a week later, I got orders to report. <laughs> and uh, this was the time, I come up in the artillery, and I come up in, uh, I was always a, a greasy ass cannoneer, and I can say a greasy ass cannoneer because I used to be one. Yeah. But, but, and it's, that's with respect and not. Yeah, I know. And, but then I, most of my time was spent in the instruments of survey and fire the, 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 the see, cannon ears had hairy ears, and that's what the yeah. songs are okay. <laughs> and then got another verse to it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <coughs> hairy ears, <coughs> army sons of bitches. <laughs> but then it goes on, it gets worse. Yeah, yeah. right. <coughs> but then, so I got orders to report, and, and it was for uh, uh, the artillery, since I had the experience and record of, of a, a gunnery officer and uh, they asked me they want to revise in the whole United States Army gunnery procedure mm -hmm. and I got in on the base work for that, that down in Fort Knox, Kentucky mm -hmm. uh, down there for about nine months, ten months, 1947 mm -hmm. and then when I come back and then I got back into the National Guard and they, they by that time they'd organized the National Guard and I come back in the next Then when, when were you relieved from active duty then on at that time? And that was in the fall of 47. Seven. Uh -huh. Then you went back to civilian life for sure. Then, then I went back, well not for sure, but <laughs> I went back to civilian life. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, now, now Bob, uh, your military career has been wonderful. And how, how did you advance then until your present uh, exalted status? Well, <laughs> you know, I served with the 38th Division, both in peacetime and right. combat. Right. I served with the 38th Division, both as enlisted in peace and war. Right. I served with both the commission officer in peace and war. And uh, uh, I served with them in just about every enlisted rank, up through certain staff sergeants. Mm -hmm. And then I served with the 38th Division as every commission rank, up to the division commander. I served with the local unit here as a battery executive officer when I first come back at local battery A. Then, then did you become a CO after that? Then I or? then I went to, in uh, 51, I become a battery commander. Mm -hmm. And then a battery, battery commander, then I come command another. I command a battery level, a captain level command for 10 years. Mm -hmm. Now when did you become an LC, the lieutenant colonel? Well, then I, and in 59, I got major, 1950. You know, you, you talk about organizations of the division uh, and, and the United States Army divisions, and we went from the, the old square division to the triangle division. Then in 1959, we reorganized again in what they called the Pentom, Pentomic Division. Oh, yes. And the Pentomic Division was, was designed for the nuclear yeah. uh, I, that's when they started having brigades too. No, it? that was when they started having battle groups. Battle, battle groups. Okay. They had five battle groups in the 
in the division. And each battle group was smaller than they are a brigade or a regiment. And then, uh, then each one of them had an artillery battalion, and the artillery battalion had uh, a mixed weapon. And it wasn't all 105. We had 105s and 155s battalions mixed, see. And, uh, uh, but it sold that you could fight separate engagements hundreds of miles apart mm -hmm. and because of the dispersion of truth in the army. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, it didn't take long to prove that Pentomic wasn't the answer. And in 1963, they reorganized it again in the Road Division. And the road division is just almost duplicated the the uh, the old triangle division. Except Other for brigades, we yeah, brigade. we had regiments in the old triangle division. Now they have brigades. They, they have what? Four battalions of artillery and two of artillery. I mean, four battalions of infantry in a in a brigade. Uh, now more or less, yes, three to four. And uh -huh. it, uh, it it's flexible. See, and, and not the same regiments either. Uh, no, not necessarily flexible. Not. It, it's uh, the old building block yeah, method, right? But we did have brigades back in the square divisions. Well, yeah, sure, and, and, and then then, uh, <laughs> then they came back to it. Yeah, and there wasn't any real reason to have a brigadier general you know, when they didn't have brigades. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But even in the triangle <laughs> division, see the division artillery, which was originally. Well, like ours was the old 63rd Field Artillery Brigade, uh, commanded by one star general. And then, and then when we reorganized in the Triangle Division, to Division Artillery, it still had a BG uh, command in it. And that went on until uh, 1960, 1959, when we went to the Division. Okay, now, now when did you get your first star? And I got my first star in 19... <coughs> 74, 5. Were you chief of artillery at that time? No, no, I wasn't. I, I was, I was the, I was chief of the artillery, I was, or the division artillery commander. At as, a time, full colonel, as a full colonel. As a full colonel. And then I was selected for a star, uh, which then I went up to the assistant division commander. Okay. So uh, then I went up to the assistant division commander, 38th division. And how long were you? Uh, not near long enough. <laughs> It was a situation at that time is I would just love to have served as assistant division commander for three or four more years. And then uh, the way the circumstances happened is uh, I was there for just better than a year and uh, they wanted me to, they offered me the division. And uh, you know as well as I do if they're they, a position like that, you better not turn it down. No, indeed. I, 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 <clears throat> I have to bring some of my own stuff here. This, this is my original helmet. That's pretty dark. It's a, it's a new Kevlar. What is it? Kevlar? Yes. They don't have liners. They don't have liners. No. And are they lighter than that? They're lighter than that, and they protect your neck better. Yeah. So they come down and protect your neck. They're like the German uh, yes. helmet. I was sort of looking at your helmet liner, and you sort of did. See, this is the... the Fiber, type. right? Not the fiber, yeah. but the hard shell. Hard, hard shell. You know, at first we had the the. This was originally designed that you could wear your helmet liner as a a pith helmet. Yeah. Made oh, I said, yeah. Remember that? Yeah. Well, no, we didn't and, have that. And, that's then, all and, and then you would wear it, and then of course this is designed that they recommend you not to wear it without. But <laughs> everybody. Did. We had wool wool hats too that fit over there yeah. for that time. But this thing is heavy, I tell you. Oh yeah. I get the, these few hairs I had caught up in that thing, so finally I just shaved, shaved them off. <laughs> you know, it's uniform and wearing the uniform and this steel pot it is. Of course, we bathed in this. Sure we pounded sure. hand strength, right. stints, stayed with it. And you know, it seems so odd. People don't realize that this. It's got to fit down there as a unit, and I, I have pounded tent tape with well, that sure. for my pup tent and all, put dents in there where the liner doesn't fit down good, and it's only it's my protection, okay. and, and then you chip it, and it's anti-metallic uh, metal there. Uh, I like it because you didn't have to take it off when you centered the needle and used uh, magnetic instruments in the... So this, you've got the number here where we, the number when I uh, went overseas. 
Uh, they had put the, everybody had to have a number. Oh, that's your own receipt. Well, right? I saw it didn't have enough digits for no, it. No, no service number. Right. Well, Bob, let me show you one thing, Doc. Right. It is a. Uh, I, I I brought it up and I might as well show it to you. Sure. Is when we was in uh, in Luzon. Uh, <coughs> is uh, of course things went fast and furious there, and I got a Japanese battle fighting off. Of off of an individual there, and uh, this young Japanese soldier, uh, they carried these in their pockets. They were they worshipped, and he had a picture of his. I made the assumption of his wife and some youngsters. I was summoned through my pictures the other day, and I found that picture. And, and I've tried to, you know, I just love to find out who it was so I could return it to him. But, uh, but this is probably a prized possession and. At least this me could have taken under. Very sure. It was, and, uh -huh. uh, but it started tattered and torn. And, but uh, well, the old rising sun. Yeah, the old rising sun. Uh, the the uh, GI called meatball, didn't they? We called a lot of things. <laughs> well, we leaving assholes for one. <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> Maybe we better raise yeah. that. Yeah. No, that's our, well, listen, Bob, it's been a pleasure. And uh, by God, I'm sure this will go down in history. By the way, you're going to get a copy of this, so you can, you're going to have to show it to our fellow. <laughs>